but I hate it when people tell me, oh man, I wanna do this, I just can't. Like, no, 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 no. If you wanna do it, you can do it. You're just getting all the bullshit excuses in the way and there's no one holding you accountable to achieve. me welcome to the show thank you very much honor to be here on this show i like to explore the mind behind entrepreneurs and what internally got them to where they are today and why they do what they do so what is your goal why do you work hard every day what are you striving for that's a great question and I think that's something that has continued to change and evolve. But I suppose it, it all kind of boils down to one simple answer. And, and it's a level of freedom, you know, and, and not so much freedom in the sense of I can have all the money and I can, you know, do whatever I want. Because in a sense, I mean, I've kind of achieved that, you know, but it's more in the sense of every single day, whatever I want to end up doing, whether I want to work 15 hours that day, or I don't want to work at all, being in a position where I get to choose that, that, that I suppose is the, the biggest reason why I do what I do to have the choice. But then there's that feeling of where you do get the freedom. Like you mentioned, you have everything. You do have that control of your time, your location, your money, but then you want to progress more. Why do you think people naturally want to continue growing? I think it comes down to, um, well, our evolution, really. I mean, I know for myself in particular, I almost feel like I'm wired that way. You know, I'm wired to the point where I can't stop. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's not where a, it's a choice. Do I want to do this or do I not? It's if I get into something, I'm going to be the best. There's not an in-between. And if someone's better than me, then I'm just trying to figure out how I can beat them. And it's not for any other reason than I need to beat them. I need to be the alpha in that situation. And I suppose that would come down to the, the absolute wire of it, you know, is like having to be the best in every situation. I mean, what man doesn't want to be the number one? Why do you think we want to be the number one? I don't know. I, it's a great question. I mean, I think for myself, I guess it would come down to I've I've not been the number one, you know? There's definitely been periods in my life where I was not the top. I was not the top of my game. I was not that alpha. And I think when you've been on the reverse side of it, you know, <laughs> for anyone that has been there, you don't want to be there, you know? It, it's not satisfying. You know, it doesn't satisfy your hunger, your need, or at least it doesn't satisfy mine, you know? But I know when I've been at the top of my game where all my peers are looking around me and they're looking to me for guidance, that's when I feel not only my best, but when I perform my best. When I'm the, I am the guy to go to. I feel like as human beings, we naturally strive for progress in just everything. And to me, not necessarily perfection, but like just progress and improvement in every aspect of life is what every human naturally wants. And what you were saying reminded me of another quote. I can't remember by who is where it says every successful person has an insecurity that they're running from which makes them want their goal or something so badly because they're trying to run away from a past life or a past identity or something. Is there any past identity that you're maybe subconsciously running from? I mean, sure, of course. 
you know, uh, I think kind of everyone, they're lying if they don't say they have something that they're bettering themselves from, right? For myself, I was a extremely overweight child. So at the age of like 14, I was 275 pounds, <laughs> you know, which is a, a fair chunk. And I wasn't very tall. All right. I hadn't hit my growth spurt yet. And so I was maybe five, five, 275 pounds at 14. And life was hard. I didn't have friends. I didn't have the social group around me. It was in a sense myself. That was my rock bottom. That's where I decided that that wasn't the life I wanted to live. And the first things I did to get, to get it better was I went to the gym. I had my best friends drag my ass to the gym. And it was quite funny because the two of them were actually trying to put on weight while I was losing weight. <laughs> so it was two different battles, but both of us still trying to achieve one common goal. And that was getting in shape. Now, without them, I, I don't think I'd be here today because they genuinely held me accountable at the beginning when I wasn't accountable for myself. Because I'll be honest, you don't get to 275 pounds at 14 by, by being accountable to yourself and having control. <laughs> you just don't. All right. So I was at that place and, and over time through their ridicule, to be very honest, I, I learned very much through a hard discipline. I like tough love. <laughs> through that, I was able to get the confidence. And it took me till I was about 16. All right. So until I was about 16, it took me to lose my weight. And I got down to 185 pounds, give or take. Uh, 80 pounds. Yeah. 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 It was, uh, nearly a hundred pounds that I lost. It was a big, a big thing, but more important than through the weight loss itself, it was everything that you gain around that, the confidence, the ability to go talk to people. Um, I remember being 14 and literally looking up videos on YouTube of how do I make friends? <laughs> you know, it was like at that point where it was like, something needs to change. Where do you think you'd be? if not for your, your friends? I think, I like to think with how I am today that I eventually would have found someone or something to force me out of it because I wanted to change. I just didn't know how. And more importantly, I didn't have the accountability. So I'd like to think that even if it didn't happen then, it would have happened a year, two, three years later. You know what I mean? Like that, that's where I like to think it would, if it didn't, I mean, hell to be very frank, you may as well, like it's, yeah, it's not a good spot that it wouldn't be a life worth living in my eyes. If that continued now, looking back, if I was dropped into that life, there wouldn't be a point. It would have to change or don't exist. You mentioned the accountability and a quote popped into my head and it says, your mouth is an inch under your nose, but you still need someone else to tell you that you have bad breath. And that, that just hit me like, there are some things that no matter how much you reflect on, no matter how much you think about, you just won't see until someone else points it out. How important is that? How important is accountability? It's massive. I mean, it's huge. Like. I guess to touch on from the weight loss side of things, I had my best friends beside me at the time every single day were holding me accountable to making sure I didn't eat bad to the point where like they, they'd say, if I went to go grab, say a handful of chips, you know, cause we were at a party and we had a, there's chips on the table. If I went and grabbed a handful of chips, he'd be like, okay, so you're going to accept being a fat shit the rest of your life. That's fine. And he just leave it with me like that. And you just damn well know you can't be that person that accepts that, you know? So it was that level of accountability for nearly a year. We spent every single day together. All right. We basically lived in each other's houses. 
um, to the point where he was one of my uh, groomsmen in my wedding this year, <laughs> you know, a, a number of years later. So he shows how much of a, a friend he is. But that was the beginning of accountability. I think it continued through not only my fitness journey, but then getting into um, business and in life. I've always done the best when there's someone there to tell me my shit stinks, you know? So I definitely see the value in that because I've gotten to be that for other people. And I know that when I've helped other people and been there to hold them accountable for the things that more importantly, they said they wanted to do. I, I'm a believer, like, if you don't want to do anything, fine. Like, just stay doing that. That's fine. But I hate it when people tell me, oh man, I want to do this. I just can't. Like, no, 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 no. If you want to do it, you can do it. You're just getting all the bullshit excuses in the way. And there's no one holding you accountable to achieve. It. So I, I know that for myself, that's been the case. You know, if I say, oh, I want to do this, I just can't. Like, no, no, no. As soon as you say the words can't, you shut off your brain from figuring out solutions. So you're taking the easy, the coward's way out, if you will. Where when you take true accountability for yourself, but also can use it through an external version of having a coach or a best friend or someone there that can help hold you accountable, it changes your life. Like it genuinely changes your damn life. You achieve way more than you ever thought you would. What? got you into business how did you like was there a single domino that fell to move you into the business path from you know your fitness journey what started that business journey not really if i'm frank like i've always had the business bone in me you know from the very beginning of my life like i i guess a little bit of like backstory i grew up quite poor all right my family was um missionaries so a christian family that helped people and when i was six months old my parents moved us to mexico and we lived in a uh, a motor home on the beach for six months and helped build houses for the homeless so we we did not have a lot of money but we always had that giving spirit and when you kind of grow up on that side of things you get a mindset around you where like you need to be entrepreneurial and uh, creative in order to have money. When it, your parents aren't going to give you any, they're not working themselves to have anything to give you. If you want pocket money, you're going to have to figure out a way to go out there and get it. And that kind of like continued to the point where when we moved back to Canada and we had been back in Canada, I was at 11 working part-time as a carpenter hat, you know, just to get some pocket money with a family best friend. So I'd go out and I'd do all of his rip outs. I literally spend like three to four hours a day ripping out carpet and linoleum and scraping the floors. So that level of entrepreneur, of knowing at a young age that I had to work hard, I had to be in business. But more importantly, when I had bosses, there was almost that certain level where I just didn't respect them. I was just like, no. <laughs> I was like, I love you, mate, but you're you're wrong. There's a better way to do this. And I think after experiencing, you know, I've done quite a few different jobs that I knew I would never get ahead if I always worked on someone else's business. You know, like even from, you know, my first job when I was doing the carpet cleaning, I knew that I was only getting paid per hour. And he was getting paid for a job. So at like 11 years old, after I had done it for six months, I said, hey, I want to get paid per job. <laughs> that way, if I work really quickly, I actually get rewarded for that. I don't want to get cut my hours because I work too quickly. So I ended up getting paid per job from him. You know, and it'd be $50 a rip up instead of $10 an hour. And it would take me five hours. You know what I mean? So I had that incentivized. So it's kind of always been there from the ground up. And it continued as I like got older, I always had side businesses. I always went door knocking, you know, door knocking has been a thing that I've done since literally I was 12 years old <laughs> from finding my first snow shoveling jobs. Um, I come from Canada originally. So a lot of snow, I'd go door to door on Christmas and around the holidays and say, Hey, can, can we shovel your driveway? It'll be 10 bucks, you know? And that's how we'd make pocket money. And that's how we'd be able to go and buy the presents. That's how I grew up. You know, so I guess that kind of just continued and naturally propelled myself into having my own business. 
What was your first entrepreneur experience? Was it the snowboarding thing? Not snowboarding. Yeah, so the first one was um, s removing snow. So me and my brother, uh, older brother Kyle, me and him got together. We went and made heaps of flyers, uh, put them up into supermarkets everywhere, okay? And we waited like a week. And we didn't have any one message. And we're like, oh my goodness. No, we know this can work. There's so many opportunity. And who doesn't want to like pay a kid? They look cute. You know, they're going to help us just because we're kids. <laughs> so I was like, well, we just need to go house to house. If they're if we're in their faces, they can't say no to me. So then that's what we did. And we just went door to door, just knocking our literally the block we lived on. And my first ever deal that I closed was my next door neighbor. All right. And the first time it was for 15 bucks to do her front driveway. And a couple weeks into doing it, I actually signed her for my first long term contract, which was the six month winter period. And I got her to pay me $100 up front to do the whole driveway for the whole winter. <laughs> and that was like the first client that we had. And that was it. Yeah, that was uh, the first entrepreneurial experience i suppose that i had almost several months like did that progress to something else or how did that go yeah it it kind of fizzled itself to to be honest my older brother went and got a, a more traditional job <laughs> as they tend to do and side things came up and ended up moving around a little bit and not living where we were so ended up not really progressing too much in that had a couple clients here and there you know what i mean Winter time. The next thing that I did, it's a great question. What did I do after that? We went, we did that. And I suppose it was when I was 16, I had just lost my weight and I was very much into fitness. Um, so I started to train friends, everyone in my class. I like, I literally, I come from a a, a smaller school so there's like 25 kids in my class every single one of them i took to the gym <laughs> i made them come at least one time with me i was like no you have to do this just trust me come here so that was like the next thing that i was like really pushing towards was having personal trainer clients and that continued um for a fair bit it didn't progress as far as i probably would have liked it to uh the gym shut me down uh, said I needed to be qualified if I wanted to continue to train. And I was like, well, I, I'm fine. I don't need to do that. You know, every young kid thinks they know everything. <laughs> so we shut down that business um, and then went and started to work for other people. Um, and then I got into construction. I worked in construction for a few years until I moved over to New Zealand and during that period, I, I kind of really realized, I was like, man, I, I don't like working for other people, but I was still doing it. You know, I was like, I didn't figure out how I was going to do it full time yet by myself because I had always started these things. I knew I, I wanted to, but I didn't know how to make it sustainable enough where I would never have to work. Do you know what I mean? Because I believe that when you work for yourself, it's not really work. Yeah. <laughs> right? that I think work is when you go and trade your time for money with someone else. But when you do it for yourself, it's. Yeah, I don't know. I just never viewed it as work. Funny, funny little uh, brain thing in my head. <laughs> so how do, you, how, do you, how do you figure out how to move from working to, for other people to working for yourself? So to be very frank, I was living in New Zealand. Uh, I'd been here just about a year and I had booked a holiday. This is a, we're talking in end of July. And I booked a holiday for September to go to Bali with my dad. <laughs> and the whole thing was I was paying for the whole trip. I bought his plane ticket. I bought my plane ticket and I had nothing else. <laughs> so I had about just shy of eight weeks to be able to come up with the funds. And I needed about $6,000. So I was like, all right, screw it. I'll go work three, four jobs. I will work a hundred hours a week. I'm going to make the money. I already committed to it. When I say I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it. Uh, and I was applying random jobs. And one of them came back to me. It was a door-to-door -door fundraising role. 
So that's where I would go around fundraising for non for profits. And I was talking to the guy and he's like, yeah, come out, experience it. And I was like, oh yeah, whatever. Okay. So the next day I come out and I'm on the turf and I see what they're doing. And the guy does two real quick, signs a couple of people up. He's like, yeah, I just made 300 bucks. I was like, what? You just made 300 bucks from doing that? And I was like, no way. I was like, how much are you capping? Like, well, how much can you earn today? He's like, oh, like however many you do, that's what you'll get paid for. And I was like, okay, bet. I uh, literally, I was like, oh, that's enough. I don't need to see any more tonight. So I went to my uh, the manager and I was like, yeah, yeah, I'm keen. I'll do it. Um, he was like, all right, cool. When can you start? And I was like, oh, well, I'm away for a week. So he's like, yeah, okay, sure. We'll start you when we get back. I showed up, got into it and and in that six week period where I needed to save, well, eight week period, I needed to save six grand. I ended up saving seven and a half thousand during that time. And I fucked off. I went to Bali. <laughs> I enjoyed Bali and didn't really think I'd ever go back to it, to be honest. I was like, yeah, that was, that was a fun experience. Uh, I was working as a subcontractor. So I worked for myself. I just was doing it with a company. Yeah. And I got an opportunity when I came back from Bali, they were like, Hey, you did fairly well at this. Like, can you come back and continue? And I was like, ah, oh, yeah. Okay. There's like three weeks till Christmas. Screw it. We'll go back and do it. You know? So I went back and once again, really enjoyed it. The whole point was do three weeks and be done. And I, then I'll go figure out what I'm actually going to do with business. <laughs> and Christmas came around. And then after Christmas, the team leader that was in place, um, quit. And he was just like, no, I'm not coming back. I don't want to work here. And the business owner hit me up and he's like, hey, we have an opportunity for you to come in as a contractor and be the, run the team. And I was like, well, I wasn't really thinking about doing this, but that's kind of a really good opportunity. You know, he's like, yeah, I'm going to teach you how to run your own business within my company. And then hopefully the whole goal is within a year, I can fire you and you'll have your own business is what he told me. And I was like, bet. <laughs> let's do it you know so ended up going with them uh, i think a couple little things changed i was still working in the same industry ended up being for someone slightly different but same kind of role and about a year and a half later yeah just coming up to two years in the industry i quit and i went off and opened up my own company and i started up my own company and from there had been doing ever the same thing and that's kind of the gist of what got me into my own business. company. Did you start? So the uh, name is the Marketing Movement Limited. Yeah. What does it do? So it's a fundraising agency. So we fundraise for large non for profit organizations. So everything from like the Red Cross, uh, Make a Wish, yeah, Save the Children. We uh, we would. Our job is to go out there and get the funds for them. So we door knock 12 hours a day. <laughs> what made you want to start that? Is it starting up in sales in the fundraising industry that made you want to start a fundraising agency? Or It was just natural progression, to be honest. Like it wasn't like fundraising isn't something that I always wanted to do. It's not like, oh man, I want to be a fundraiser. Like I, and at the moment I'm actually transitioning and pivoting. But at the time it was like, okay, so I was, a, I was a fundraiser and now I'm the the lead and now I'm the team leader and now I'm, well, shit, the next steps is for me to own my own business. Okay. Yeah. We'll set that up. Okay. Now I have my own company and I'm running the contracts and, and I'm working with the clients and I'm doing everything hands on. And, and I was like, okay, that's a little bit interesting, but yeah, more just naturally happened into it, which I know sounds weird because how do you just naturally start a business? But for me, it literally just, it happened without even thinking it's happening. Was there any mindset shift that you had to make going from operating within a business to operating the business? I mean, don't get me wrong. Of course there was. However, after the first six months of working inside the guy's business, I was basically running. So he didn't do anything. He, he got the money to come in and he paid the guys, but that that's it. I, I was running all the interviews. I was doing the bookkeeping. I was, you know, 
running the office as the first one in and the last one out. So like, to the point where like I painted the damn office when I wanted it to be redone, I painted the office. So I had my business and I had my guys, we were just all contracting through him, if that makes sense, where he didn't really have a say in what I was doing as much, uh, because it was that contractor model, obviously some type of rules applied, but they were more just industry rules. So I think it just kind of naturally shaped itself, but the reality was he was a coach at the beginning. You know, he was someone that was coaching me on how to change that mindset and how to become a leader more importantly, because I think to run in business, the biggest thing people struggle with is how to become a leader and how to actually lead other people. How do you lead other people? From the front, from the damn front. There, one thing that is very clear and it was very clear to me then, but working in something like fundraising made it very clear was there's a big difference between a leader and a manager. Okay. A manager runs things and uh, likes to make sure the, the numbers work, if you will. Okay. Um, fill a spot, do this, do that, send out orders. Doesn't necessarily always get the best results. Where a leader, they're still doing all of that, but they'll never ask someone to do something they haven't already done and are doing themselves. You know, like to this day, I still have my fundraising agency. And if I ask the guys to go out there and door knock, you know, for eight to 12 hours at any day, if they, they're like, now Liam, we need you out here. Okay. For X, Y, and Z reason, I'm going to make that happen because a good leader does not leave people to do something he's not willing to do. I have a principle within all my companies that I have to outwork everyone else. So basically I'm always, I always push myself to be the hardest working person in the, in the team. And I always challenge whoever's under me to, you know, let's go try and outwork. Like let's compete. And I try to always enforce that, that if you're at the head of the company, you have to be able to work harder than everyone else. And if you can't do that, then you don't deserve to be bad. Basically. hundred percent. Yeah, no, I, I can, I can definitely resonate with that because it's literally, so one of the things we do in that business is like, we do road trips. Okay. So once a month we go away for a week or two weeks just to be able to fundraise in a new location, get some fresh doors, if you will. And my goal on those things is to, if I have three guys working with me, is I need to outperform all three of them and put it together. That's my goal every single time. So if I don't outperform all of them combined, I consider that trip a failure on my side. A success on theirs, but a failure on my side. So that's always the competition that's going on and really pushing to make sure it happens. And it's good. I mean, it fires up not only myself, but it also creates that team environment and the competitiveness and uh, the like, yeah, we're not in this alone, you know? I always felt when I had a manager, it was like, man, th this guy's getting me to do all the shit work. He's not doing it. <laughs> Why do I have to, you know? Why do you think it's important for the leader to be both at the head of the company and at the head of the workforce in terms of how much work they do. I think because you go to your leader for advice, you know, and I don't necessarily think that they need to put in the most time every single day. Cause I, I believe like there is a big thing about paying your dues, you know, and I think at a certain level, once you have done those things, you kind of have those skills, but it's being able to step back into it at any second. And the reason that's kind of important is because people come to you for advice. When you're leading them, you're you're not just one of them. You are leading them how to do it. And if you don't have the experience and you don't have room between where they are at the moment and where you are or have been, then where the hell are you leading them to? You, you are just, you're just one of their peers and you decided to take control but you're not actually giving them room to grow. So I believe a leader develops the people with him and underneath of him to bring them to that next level. 
So if you don't have room in between where they are and where you are, it's very hard to do so. And then you can go even further and say a great leader gets to that point and then continues to push them to get the most out of themselves, realizing that even though we want to be number one in everything, we're not going to be, <laughs> you know, even though I'd like to be the alpha in every situation, I understand that I'm not. And understanding that when you're leading a team, there's going to be some of them that are better at things than you. And a good leader uses that to his, his advantage. All right. And it is, you know, because it gets the most out of that person, but it also pushes them in a way where they wouldn't have done it by themselves. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Unlock that full potential, if you will. If I was starting a company today, my first company, and I was looking to hire some people to help me with it. What advice would you give me to run that company properly and scale? Well, that comes to two questions. My first question would be how much capital do you have? Because you acquire talent in one of two ways. You either acquire it with money or time. Uh, you either build the talent yourself or you pay enough that the talent comes to you. So it really depends. If you, I'm going to say with the early side where you might not have the capital because you're just starting your very first company. And in that case, it's start something that you're going to be comfortable in and that you're, and by comfortable, I mean something that you have experience with. I think a lot of people that I've seen on a money Twitter, if you will, start businesses when they haven't even fucking done it themselves. You know, my, my friends, but they're like, oh man, I've done, I did a 5k week guys. I, you know, I did a 5k month and like they start a company and they hire other people. And then they're like going over and doing it. And like, don't get me wrong. I'm ambitious and I love people to go for it. But you need to know what you're actually doing in order for you to start that. So I guess that kind of brings me back into the whole leadership side is you need to be better than what you're bringing in. All right. So that way you can continue to lead them forward. And you're not only progressing yourself, because as a leader, I think if you're asking your guys to learn and get better, you better be doing the same. Otherwise, they're going to catch up to you. And now they're going to be the leader. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So if you want to stay that leader, you got to continue to self-develop. So that'd be a little advice. Keep growing. Yep. Yeah, that'd be the advice. Keep growing yourself and make sure you actually know the industry before you get into it. What you said reminded me of money to Because yesterday there's an agency owner that I was on a call with and he told me that he was newly starting his agency, doing about $500 a month, one month in, and got in his first client $500 a month. And on his Twitter, he had, I'll make you 5K per month. And I was like, wait, you're talking about how to make 5K per month, but you haven't done that. And it's something I've noticed again and again over money Twitter and everywhere. And I, I posted this on Twitter. I said, there are many people on Twitter that don't really know what they're doing, but post about it. Like, for example, myself, there's a reason why I say I help agencies reach six figures. I don't say seven figures or eight figures because I've never made, I've never built a seven figure agency. I've built a six figure one, but not seven figure. So I'm always really strict on not preaching something that you haven't done. Why do you think, apart from the ego side of things, why do you think money tweeters are like that in the sense that people are there teaching what they don't know? Yeah. I mean, obviously, like you touched on, there is obviously the ego side, right? People want to be the best. But I also think it kind of comes to the question that you asked me earlier and, and it's, you know, what's your insecurities? And I think a lot of people tend to push up or inflate what they've done because they're insecure about what they've done. And they think if they talk this big game that they're going to be able to, you know, just get the results, the classical saying, like, I'll fake it till you make it. And don't get me wrong. I love that saying. All right. But I think. 
it's something that you you do when you're internal you do when you're with people you know if if say you ask me to do a job and you came to me right and you're like hey i have an opportunity liam i need you to build me a six-figure agency i'd be like yeah i got that <laughs> you know i've never done that however i would be sitting there and i would figure it out that's what faking to faking it till i make it means but when you say you can give someone the results when you've never done it and you're going to approach people, I feel like you're just straight up scamming. You know what I mean? Like in this, in the easiest sense of the word, like you're offering something that you don't even know how to do where it's different if people come to you. Do you know what I mean? But I guess that doesn't really answer the whole money Twitter question. I, th I think people are just, yeah, they, they, they're insecure and they want to put up bigger results because it makes them feel good. And at the end of the day, if they can get a couple of happy comments, people think they're succeeding. And um, it's motivation, masturbation, you know, it yeah. makes them feel great for the minute. And then they'll actually hold off. You know, they won't feel terrible about their situation for five minutes. Well, they'll that... feel, yeah, go for it. They'll feel complacent in what they do. And when they're feeling complacent, they'll go and post on Twitter because it makes them feel good for five minutes. And then when they're feeling bad again, they're going to go and give it again because they're going through that instant gratification instead of the long term. And then they never end up doing what they keep saying they're doing. Exactly. And I feel that stunts progress because you get, you're getting a taste of the reward that makes you cope and not do anything, which is going to just hold you back. Yeah, I mean, an example of that was I had a guy on Twitter, um, and don't get me wrong, I, I I thought the kid was really nice, but he's like, hey, you know, like I love your posts and everything. Uh, or I'm a copywriter. I'm a ghostwriter, right? I'll happily write all your tweets for you. I'll get you up to 10,000 followers in the next six months. And the kid had like 400 followers. <laughs> and I was like, you're selling me 10,000, but you have 400. You know, and I said, I was like, all right, perfect. Tell me how many clients do you have? He's like, oh, um, I've done this one. I was like, all right, show me the profile. And he's like, oh, well, I, I start with them next week. <laughs> I was like, all right, perfect. And I was like, how much money do you have? Like, where did you learn this? He's like, oh, I've kind of just like learned it from free. I was like, how many have you done for? He's like, oh, well, no one yet. I'm just starting. And I was like, okay. Do you actually, like, why do you want to do this? He's like, oh, to make money. I was like, all right. Abandon doing this because I'll be very frank. You're not good at it yet. All right. Leave that, go learn sales because when you get into anything, you need to know how to sell, whether you are a ghostwriter, whatever you want to do, you need to know how to sell your services. Go devote yourself to be a sales rep for someone and learn. Eat shit and learn. So when you come back to this and you actually are good at copywriting and you've done some courses and you actually know what you're doing, you're going to be able to sell that in a proper manner. <laughs> you know? So that was just an example of money Twitter at its finest. But I think like if you have more experience, how can you promise the results? You and I what you said about sales being essential. I remember when I was starting my first agency many months back, about a year back now. I didn't know anything about sales. I just saw an Iman Gazi video and I was like, yes, this is what I should do. <laughs> so I started doing that and, you know, Struggled to get sales call because I didn't know anything about copywriting. Finally got sales call, messed it up because I thought, you know, I'll think about it, man. They'll think about it and get back to me. It turns out it didn't mean that. Uh, but... It doesn't? <laughs> and after I finished doing the agency thing, I learned just how important sales is in every business. And it reminded me of something that A boss of mine said when I used to work as a sales rep in a hotel, and he said, you know, without the sales team, there's no business. Well, I was speaking to him because the sales team, we worked seven days a week. We had no off days, whereas the other teams would get like weekends off, Sunday off. We were there every day. And he was like, well, there's no sales team. There's no business. We can't operate. Nothing will happen. And it made sense because sales is the center of everything in business. 100%. I mean, it, it it's even the center of everything. 
like not even just in business, but every single interaction that you have, people don't like to talk about this because there's the negative condensations of, oh, salespeople, I don't like that. You know, and now they're rebranding ourselves as, oh, we're consultants. Yeah, you know, we're all consulting for someone else. <laughs> so in different labels, same thing. But every single conversation that you have in your life, you're either getting sold to or you're buying. All right. So you're either getting sold to or you're selling yourself. One of the two are happening. It's quite bizarre when you start to like actually break down everything in your life and you're like, man, that conversation, he, he was telling me about how good he was in that situation. I was buying <laughs> and vice versa, you know, like even this conversation there, you're selling me the mindset and I'm selling you my answers in a lot of ways. Reminds me of when I was speaking to someone and telling them how Similar to what you're saying, everything is sales. Like if you want your mom to buy you a gift when you're a kid, you have to close her. If you want to go to the movies with your friend, you have to close him on why she should go. Like everything. There's a girl you want to date, you have to close her. Like everything in life is sales. You're these sales. Do you think if I was a guy with this zero skills and wanted to get into the entrepreneurship space, would sales be the best starting point for me? Hands down. I, I tell that person, if they're serious and they're committed, I want you to go knock on doors for a year. You will learn more about entrepreneurship and yourself, the confidence, the resilience. The biggest one is the resilience that you will learn in anything else. Okay, doing a year of door knocking. And I'm not talking, oh, yeah, I did five doors. No, go talk to 60 to 80 people every single day. You know, if you can do 60, 80 people a day and you do that seven days a week, you're going to talk to at least 10,000 people in your first year. All right, you can talk to 10,000 people. Well, now you're going to get somewhere. Now you're going to have some resiliency. If you're smart, you're going to take a guy. You're going to take some notes and you're going to more importantly, get some contacts built because you're going to come across some amazing people. And those people that you're going to meet probably going to be able to help you in whatever you do. And it doesn't matter what you're selling. I mean, man, you can go door to door for pest control, window cleaning, fundraising. I, I don't really care what you do, but too many people try to start things when they don't have a damn backbone. So they quit after a few months once it's hard. But if you were to do something like door knock, you'd realize that it's all a numbers game. Everything in life goes down to being a numbers game. If you haven't succeeded yet, you're paying down your ignorance debt and you're pretty close to succeeding. You know, I love that um, that quote from Alex Hermosi. You know, he's like, the biggest thing that is costing you the most money is your ignorance debt. You know, it costs you a million dollars a year yeah. to not know how to make a million dollars a year. And I think too many people just accept that. And they're just like, oh yeah, I, I don't know how to do that instead of figuring out how to actually pay that debt down and figure out how to make it happen. And it's similar to the economic concept of opportunity costs. Like you always have that opportunity to make a certain amount of money. So if you're not making that, you're losing out on that opportunity. And that's the cost. Exactly. There's something I started last, last week, last episode, and I want to try continuing for the next 10 or so episodes and just see ask by asking the same question to each guest, what kind of answers I get. So what is one thing that most people believe that you believe to be false? I like that question. So just to repeat, what's one thing that I believe, sorry, what's one thing that everyone else believes that I believe to be false, correct? Yeah. I think too many people believe, and not everyone, but a, but a damn big chunk of it, believe that because life is hard, and I mean hard in the sense of struggling with money, it's going to continue to be that way. And that the people on the top that are rich are somehow evil. All right. I think way too many people believe that. And it's such a messed up thing because 
every person that I know that is heavily successful and had as a high net worth are the nicest people that I've ever met. And some of the poorest people I've met are some of the biggest scumbags. However, everyone always thinks, oh, the rich guy's out to get me. <laughs> Why do you think people oh, believe that? What was that, sorry? Why do you think people believe that, you know, the rich guys are the evil ones and the poor guys are the poor ones? I think it comes down to it's the easy answer. You know, it's easier to blame someone else that has everything for the reason you have yeah. You know, it's easy for me to say, oh, man, the reason I don't have a podcast is because Anwar has a podcast. But that's not true. That's just reflecting your own insecurities onto someone else. Just because someone else is successful doesn't mean you can't be. I believe that, you know, very much along the whole Gary Vee side, there's enough room for everyone to win. You know, or a lot of people, I think, don't. They, they think that because, because you made $100, I lost $100, when that isn't the case. You know, just because people are succeeding and winning in business, it doesn't mean someone else is losing. Or I believe a lot of um, brokies, I'll call them, <laughs> have that mindset where they're getting taken away from when, they, uh, when someone else is becoming rich. I think there was a time I saw a video that was saying, looking at how much money Elon Musk has, saying if you just gave one million dollars of his, like if you removed all his money and split it into one million dollars, you could basically solve all the problems in the world and feed everyone. Like there's way more money in circulation than what Elon has. There's way more money than what most people think. Like. I don't want to enter anything about how I believe the banking system works, but you know, these guys just type in numbers and that's it. And in one second, it comes from non-existent one second to, oh, now, now there's that. Yeah. <laughs> like there really is enough for most people, but just most people don't know how to access it. And it's because of their own beliefs and their own ignorance, not really anyone's fault, at least in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, ignorance is bliss, I suppose you can say. And I know it's such a cliche, but you don't know what you don't know. But at the same time, I feel like there's a certain level inside of everyone or at least I know it's inside of me and I hope to God it's inside of everyone where they always internally know, you know, like if I'm doing something wrong or I'm not doing something to my full potential, I know I might not want to, I might not accept that answer. And I might tell myself, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm doing fine. Or this is the only thing, but I know. And I think intrinsically we all have that. I think the biggest thing is people deny that. And people suppress that feeling to the point that it doesn't exist. Yeah. But it still exists. They're just not like acknowledging it. Like I always believe that self-perception being to me the most important trait that you can have. Being able to notice those things. Notice when you're bullshitting yourself. Notice when you're lying. When you're choosing to be ignorant. Because like you said, I believe... Any problem that you face internally, at least, is like already solved. You already know what the problem is. You already know how to solve it, but you just don't accept it's there. And whenever I was speaking to like my friends or something, I always mentioned that like I'm lost. What should I do? I feel like shit. You know, things aren't working out. I'll be like, all right. First thing you do is find out why are you feeling like shit. And I'll tell them, like, you already know why. You know the exact reason why. You just have to find out. And if it takes you one week, if you're going on some mental journey for one week, then just know you're lying to yourself. It shouldn't take more than five seconds. Because it's right there. Where it's going to be, you know, with some invisible clothes to make it hidden. No, I, I agree. I mean, 
I think it kind of comes back to what I was saying there, and that's that people like to bullshit themselves. You know, people like to wrap up really, really simple things and make them to be really, really complex and hard. So they have a reason to not do it and not to face it. <laughs> you know, it's that whole, uh, you put a small little present inside of a really big box and it makes it look like a really big present. But people do that in their own minds with their thoughts. You know, like people are like, I hear all the time, man, making $10,000 a month, right? Like that's the classic thing on many, on money Twitter is how to make 10K a month. People kind of put it on like a pedestal and they're like, oh man, I, <clears throat> I don't know how I would ever do that. Or it just, it's so far off. It's so hard to get. And it just like, the reality is they probably know exactly what they need to do. Yeah. They just don't want to acknowledge it because then that means that they're yeah, faced with a much harder reality, which is they're just lazy because it's easier. It's easier to be lazy. It's easier to blame other people. It's the whole herd, herd mentality, you know, the Jones theory. Everyone is, else is doing it, so eh, it'll be okay. I might, it might be shit, but everyone else is shit, so at least, at least I won't stink too bad because everyone else smells just as bad. <laughs> you know what? And I know it might sound like a simple answer, but I think it is genuinely what it comes down to is people just are lazy and and don't want to actually put in the work. So it's interesting to me why people choose to be lazy and choose to just get their mind on to focus on, you know, how to survive, how to keep the bare minimum instead of how to strive. Like why, where do you think that comes from? I think a portion of it is conditioning. You know, the current education systems that are in the world, they are in place to create employees and employees have jobs and jobs is just over broke, you know? So the whole system in itself isn't lined up for people to succeed. It's, you know, it comes from back in the day when we needed men and women to fill factories. And that's what all we needed. We didn't need people to think. We didn't need people to thrive. We needed people to do the bare minimum and, and do what was needed of them so that the country could continue to develop and more importantly, the businesses could make money, you know, and that's a whole nother rabbit hole that we could go down. <laughs> but I think there is that level of conditioning, but I also think that you're lying to yourself and you're taking an easy route if you decide to just accept that. With the amount of influence, even on you grab me a random kit in the middle of, in the middle of Indonesia and a random kid in the middle of Mexico and get me one from the States and Australia. They know what they have to do in order to be successful. You know, they might not know how to do it, but they, like you, you get those kids together and be like, oh, I need to start a business. And like, there's so much access these days. And if kids can have access to it, you are lying through your teeth if you think you don't. I mean, I love the fact how many kids became like extremely wealthy and rich off of crypto, you know, 12, 13 year olds that are just pounding it, you know, because it's like, man, I hope your, I hope your dad and your stepdad and your mom and your stepmom hates themselves because they didn't do anything. I hope that because hopefully it'll push them to the point where they actually do something. Because if kids are out there doing it these days, man, once again, you're just making bullshit excuses and not doing it. Why? It's easier to not. It's easier to have a pity party. That's the first thing that comes to my mind is, you know, Newton's law of motion where he says an object remains in the same state unless another force is applied to it. So it's interesting that that even applies to the mind and how people think it was like, you need that force, you need that push to get started on doing something. You won't just do it yourself. I think that that can come from internally though. 
you know, I don't think it has to necessarily be an external thought. I think our brains are strong enough and more and complex enough to make that happen within our own head. You know, like if you've been, I'm talking about a dude in his thirties, he's been working at McDonald's since he was 16 and, or even let's go better. We'll even go better. He's been working at the supermarket, pushing trolleys for the last 15 years. That's all he's ever done. All right. And it's just, he's in a repetitive state. I believe just through the world of what it is right now, if he were to decide in his head, enough is enough, he could completely change his life around in not even a couple months. I don't think anything would have to happen in order for that to happen. You know, I mean, it blows my mind how many people live ordinary lives and ordinary and do ordinary things that don't do it at an extraordinary level. Me and my friends, we always kind of say, man, if we were ever normies, we do it at such a high level, <laughs> you know? Like I, I just couldn't go through life and, and be a normal person without just like hacking the system. Uh, the simplest one that comes to my mind is how many people do a job and they continue to do it for years and years with, and never ask for a raise. And the simple reason they never ask for a raise means they're never going to get one. Why would a company pay more money for the same work if you never asked if the, if there's no reason for them to give it to you? You know? And like I talked to friends back home, like, oh man, I'm really struggling. Like I haven't gotten a raise in three years. So I was like, oh, when was the last time you asked for one? Oh, three years ago. Oh, perfect. Yeah, good. I'm glad you've accepted the last three years of that. <laughs> you know what I mean? And like you could instantly continue to work in that normal job, be that supermarket guy. But you ask for a raise every three to six months. I bet you you're going to be close to earning what a manager earns while you're on trolleys, just because you continue to ask. That concept, though, you need to ask to get something. It reminds me of something that my dad did with me when I was growing up, and where he would always make it hard for me to ask for something. But once I'd ask for it. It's easy, but you'd always put that pressure on making it harder for you to ask. And I remember there was a time that the time that it whole, the whole thing clicked in my head when I noticed what he was doing was a time that I was going through when he had this fridge mark magnets. And one of them was a quote that said, everything you want lies on the other side of fear. It was like, he would make that barrier of fear to ask and make that caution and make it scary to ask for something. But once you ask, once you cross that barrier, everything you want is there. And it was just interesting to think of that. Like if you are ready to ask for what you want, if you know what you want and you're ready to ask for it, then you can get it. And whether that's asking someone else or asking yourself on how you're going to get it, then, you know, it's, it's possible. It's something that I struggle with, not myself of asking, because I, I'm a really good at asking. I love asking. I will ask the hardest, most unsocially correct questions if I want to know. I, I don't care. But what's been hard with me is, is figuring out why other people don't feel like they can ask those questions. Like, I'll give you an example. I was talking to my mom um, about they were going through some hard times. And I said, like, why haven't you asked? Why haven't you asked help? We have, I have, I'm a baby of six kids. <clears throat> okay, so they have six kids. I said, you're struggling. <clears throat> why have you not reached out to us? and asked for help, you know, we'd do anything to help. And she just, her answer was like, I just can't, like, I, I just don't do that. That's not something I do. And then she ended up telling me a story about when she was 17 and she had moved out of home. <clears throat> we come from Manitoba. She moved to Saskatchewan. It's like 12 hours away. And she remembers being so broke 
and having so little money that she was flavoring cotton balls with salt and pepper and eating them to fill her stomach. And I said, like, why, why wouldn't you go ask? You know, if you would have went and asked for food, someone would have given you it. She's like, I just, I just couldn't. And then I was like, so what happened? She's like, well, I eventually, my dad eventually found out and he came down and he picked me up and, you know, brought me food and I was fine after that. And I said, I was like, like, you put yourself through that. Why would you do that? And she couldn't give me an answer. And it's still something to today. I'm trying to figure out why she would put herself through such pain. And don't get me wrong, I think sometimes pain can be a great thing, right? You, you learn from pain. But when you'd repeatedly put yourself in that position and the simple thing, all you had to do was ask. But so many people don't, you know? Like, yeah, just it blows my mind a little bit. And when I think about it and why people would do that, it I see two reasons why it could happen. One is there may be an ego side of it. And then the second is a selfless side of it, where you don't want to disturb anyone. You don't want to take from anyone. You don't want to dis disturb or disrupt anyone's way of life because now they have to provide for you do you think it comes from one of those or something else? I, I would assume so. And, and that's kind of the conclusion that I've come to is as well as people do it for probably one of those two reasons. Um, but at the same time, it just, it, it, it's such a foreign concept to me, I suppose. And it's something that I've continued to look at is why, why, and why? Why are people either so egotistical that they could have their life be better if they just ask for help, but they won't because they're too egotistical, which blows my mind. Or the fact that they feel so guilty and so burdened that if they ask for help, they would be a burden on someone else. Like, <clears throat> those two things just kind of blow my mind. <clears throat> but I'm also the type of person where end of last year, I needed $40,000 in a pinch to settle on one of my houses that was under construction. And my money was tied up. I, I didn't have anything that was there. I, I literally just went to one of my guys that works for me. And I said, hey, I know you have $40,000 in your savings account. Can you transfer all that to me? I need it today. And he did. He did. He transferred all to me. I finished everything up. About a month and a half later, I returned it to him plus a little extra. <laughs> all right? That wouldn't have been solved and that would have been a really big pain in my ass if I didn't just ask a question. And I think a lot of people really struggle with doing that. But if they can really get over that thing, they're going to be really successful in life. Like, if you imagine if you ask one really good question to every single person you met every single day, even if that question was as simple as, can I have $5? Can you teach me one thing? Can you introduce me to a good contact? When you start to do that and you start to do it of a place of not, oh, you have to do that, you know, for me, but of like, can you? And you come with like a a very receiving and a very receptible mindset of I'm happy either way with your outcome but I need to ask because my life only gets harder if I don't and I know that that option there is there so it'd be silly to not take it why do you think you haven't had a problem with asking I don't know it's something even my wife today she like how can you ask the way you do and I, I don't know I I've tried to go through and I've tried to like think what could have possibly happened in my life. Because it's not something like it's, it's just recent. It's always been there. Like, don't get me wrong. I think it's been cultivated a little bit, but it's not like when I was younger, I was so afraid of asking and now I over ask. I feel like I've just always been like, if I have a question, I'm just going to ask it. 
it didn't matter who it was, you know, and it didn't matter what it was. If I wanted 20 bucks, I just go, oh, can I have 20 bucks? You know? And same instance, like I'd go up and yeah, do the opposite. If someone was like, I was like, I saw someone struggling, be like, can, can I help you? Oh, sure. Because I think a lot of people will struggle at the same time. And if you do have that gift, which I, I've come to the conclusion it's a gift that I got. It's a gift that I got from God, to be honest. Because, and I believe because I have that gift, I have to share it with others. I have to let them know the power of that gift. And more importantly, if they won't accept that, sometimes I just have to use that gift in their favor. We have a closing tradition on this podcast where the last guest asks a question to the next guest without knowing who that next guest is. So we get one question from the last guest as well as the audience without knowing who they're asking the question to. So the question we have from the last guest is, what's your favorite Alex Formosi quote? I think it would be the, the whole ignorance debt one. All right. It costs you a million dollars a year to not make a million dollars. If you had to make one action step off of that quote, what would that be? Figure out how the hell to make a million dollars. <laughs> but more importantly, I know how to make a million dollars. Just continue to do the work till it's there. Question from the audience. How do you deal with a situation where you can't help but be a lone wolf? You deal with that. You take it head on and you make and you become that fucking best wolf you can be. I think even though I do believe that you need to have a team around you to succeed at an extremely high level, I believe there's a period in time in every man's life and every woman's life, really, where they're going to be alone. And it's up to you to push through that. And it's really a chance for you to prove to yourself the person that you want to be. You might not even be that person yet, but it's that opportunity because there's no one else there. It's literally yourself and your thoughts. So it gives you that opportunity to prove it to yourself of whatever that has to be in context. Because the biggest thing with being a lone wolf is you're never truly alone. You always have yourself and your thoughts. However, when you're alone, you're stuck with only your thoughts. And I think that's the most daunting part of being a lone wolf is people have to listen to those internal thoughts that they've been able to suppress. How do you be able to eventually move out of being a lone wolf and finding your tribe? Ask. Ask, ask, ask. If you ask one question to every single person you meet, you will eventually not be alone. You know, if you wouldn't have reached out to me and asked me to be on your podcast, we wouldn't have had this last hour and a half conversation. If, if I wouldn't have asked my friend for $40,000, I wouldn't be living in the house I am today. If, yeah, you could just go on with example after example. If I didn't ask for a raise every single six months at work, I wouldn't have gotten them. So ask. If you ask, the people will come into your life. And a great wee little story for that off the bat. All right. When I first came to New Zealand, me and my best friend, we wanted to go around successful people. We thought to ourselves, where are successful people? Where are rich people? They're on the yachts, right? They're down at the water. If they have a yacht, they probably have money. So we jumped the fence. We were walking around the yachts and looking for people. And we were just looking for someone to say, hey, can we come on your yacht? And we asked that question three times. And the third guy was like, hell yeah, come have a rum. Ended up becoming a really good friend, got us our first jobs in New Zealand, gave us a key to the yacht. And every week we had drinks with him on the yacht for six months. Yeah, it's been great having you on the show. I appreciate you. I appreciate your time and really enjoyed this conversation. I feel there are a lot of things that I learned and a lot of things that I hope will be useful to whoever's watching this. Where can the people watching find you? The best place to find me is follow me on Twitter. It's where I post all my 
thoughts? The question is, what is my Twitter handle? It's a great ask question. It's Liam Shaw work. So if you wanna you wanna find me, you wanna see some of my stuff, or you wanna talk to me, give me a follow on Twitter, send me a message. I respond to every person. I love to have conversations that are in depth and meaningful. If you ask me how I am, I'm gonna actually tell you. I'm not just gonna say good bro, you because <laughs> there's no point in that. So wanna find me? Find me on Twitter. Thank you for having me, mate. Cheers. <laughs>